So it appears that we are officially uh, live. So hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always, within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I'm George Cafedzis, a master's graduate from Thomas Euler's group and currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again uh, begin by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this ever-expanding initiative towards a greener uh, and much more accessible seminar world. Having said that, allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from University of Oregon, Professor Chris Neal. Following his uh, honors undergrad in physics, uh, Chris stayed at Stanford, uh, joined the lab of Stephen Smith uh, for his PhD in neuroscience and studied the function and development of the ZebraFish visual system. In 2005, he moved to UC San Francisco and the lab of uh, Michael Stryker, uh, uh, where he focused on the visual processing uh, and perception at the visual cortex of mice. And among many other important findings, they showed that the organism's behavioral state uh, modulates its cortical visual responses. In uh, 2011, he started his lab in the University of Oregon and has remained there ever since, uh, nowadays as an associate professor at the Department of Biology and Neuroscience and as affiliate faculty in the Department of Physics. In uh, his lab, they focus on the visual system, uh, how it encodes the natural world and how these computations uh, instruct or lead to behavior. Taking it uh, directly from uh, his uh, lab's website, there are three main branches of research, natural visual uh, behavior, visual processing and brain states, and a third that I have not mentioned yet, neural circuits for vision in the octopus. Uh, personally, I'm very excited to be having Chris here with us, uh, presenting the latest and I'm sure exciting findings in his talk entitled Neural Circuits for Vision in the Natural World. So without any further ado from my side, please all welcome uh, Professor Neil. Uh, Chris, the stage is officially all yours. All right, let me uh, share a screen. Uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen there now. Yep. Great. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, George, and to you and Tom for uh, inviting me to participate in this really uh, wonderful uh, venue uh, and the opportunity to tell you about our work uh, studying uh, neural circuits for vision in the natural world. So when you think about studying uh, vision or you tell somebody you study vision, uh, they often picture something like an eye exam. So a head fixed uh, subject, looking at a two-dimensional screen, analyzing geometric stimuli, making some arbitrary discrimination such as E versus F. But we actually use our vision for much more interesting things out in the real world. Uh, we use our vision to be able to track a fast moving object and intercept it like a tennis ball. Uh, we also use our vision to be able to navigate through the world. Um, I really like this video from Mary, Hay Mary Hayhoe's lab that shows how complex the task of just walking down a path is. Not only do you have to find the path, which just differs from the background based on some minor textural changes, but the whole thing is continuously moving. So the visual scene is constantly shifting, which makes this a much more computationally challenging problem. Uh, we also use our vision to be able to detect hidden objects, for example, to see this camouflaged octopus here. And of course, the octopus itself has to use vision in order to be able to analyze the visual scene and choose the appropriate camouflage pattern. So despite this richness of how we and animals use vision out in the natural world, we often study it in the lab in a situation very similar to the eye exam, a head fixed subject looking at two dimensional geometric stimuli, making an arbitrary decision. So what I want to tell you about today is our work over the past few years, trying to move towards paradigms that are do a better job of capturing the richness of how we actually use vision out in the world. The talk will be about our work studying natural vision in the mouse. Uh, I'll start off focusing on prey capture, uh, which is a paradigm that we developed uh, to be able to analyze visual function and the underlying circuits. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some of our more recent work uh, looking at uh, developing methods uh, to study neural coding during free movement. And then finally, uh, as George mentioned, at the end, I'll tell you about some of our uh, most recent work uh, looking at visual processing in the octopus. So before I dive into natural vision uh, in the mouse, I want to tell you a little bit about what motivated us to move towards studying natural vision. Uh, and in fact, this goes back to work that I did as a postdoc in Michael Stryker's lab uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, we wanted to be able to, this was around the time when optogenetics and a whole range of uh, exciting genetic tools were coming out. We wanted to be able to use these uh, tools to be able to study visual processing, to address some of the long standing questions, uh, going back to Hubel and Weasel, things like how do you get orientation selectivity, uh, but to be able to take advantage of these tools in the mouse to be able to study it. Uh, a big question at the time though, was can you actually even study vision in the mouse? You know, aren't mice blind? 
Um, it's not actually such a bad question. Uh, in fact, mice do have very low acuity vision. Uh, an image like this ends up looking like this to the mouse. So the big question is, you know, given that they're working in this lower resolution re regime, are other aspects of visual processing conserved? Are they basically running similar algorithms, but just on lower resolution information coming in? Or perhaps have they lost some of the major aspects of cortical processing that had been studied previously in, in cat and monkey? So I did a series of recordings uh, for mouse V1, looking at a number of different properties, things like orientation selectivity, uh, contrast invariant tuning, and found that most of these to first order were indeed conserved in the mouse. Uh, the one I want to tell you about today uh, was the spatial structure of receptive fields. What's the pattern of light and dark that causes the neuron to fire? Uh, part of the reason uh, uh, bringing this up is uh, to motivate some of the later experiments that we did looking at natural behavior, uh, but also because this idea of mapping receptive fields is going to come up multiple times uh, in the talk today. So what we want to do is we wanted to look and see what's the pattern of light and dark that causes a neuron to fire. And of course, going back to Hubel and Weasel, they showed that it was uh, that neurons in uh, cat and monkey uh, V1 tend to respond to oriented bars or edges of light. So we want to see if the same thing would be true uh, in the mouse. We use a technique uh, known as the spike triggered average receptive field. Uh, the way we do this is shown here. Um, we show these band limited uh, noise stimuli to the mouse while we're recording activity in V1. Every time a neuron fires a spike, we take the image that was on the screen immediately preceding that uh, spike or at a, a short lag. We average these all together and get what's known as the spike triggered average. It's essentially the average stimulus that preceded a spike uh, given certain constraints on this stimulus set uh, uh, can be um, shown to be equivalent to the linear kernel of the neuron's response. And for this particular neuron here, you can see that indeed it responded to a light uh, bar with dark edges. Uh, very similar to what Hubel and Weasel would have drawn on their light screen many years ago. Uh, so this was very reassuring. We saw some receptive fields that looked familiar. Uh, we measured a number of these receptive fields. Uh, several examples are shown here. Uh, now it's color coded. So the region when it, where the neuron is responding to dark is in blue, uh, light is in red. So this neuron here is responding to an elongated dark spot. Uh, this one is responding to an edge uh, between light and dark. And this one's responding to a dark uh, bar uh, with light flankers. Uh, we compared our data uh, to some similar data that had been recorded by Dario Ringach in the monkey. And you can see that uh, the types of receptive fields that uh, Dario found were quite similar to what we found. Uh, one thing I'll point out here is this is a 20 degree scale bar. This is a one degree scale bar. So the receptive fields in the mouse are much larger, uh, but you can see that they look quite similar. Uh, you might think that that's just because I cherry picked the right examples, I put them in the MATLAB color scheme, so everything ends up looking the same. Uh, for the uh, vision folks out there, we actually fit these uh, to Gabor functions, calculated a couple of scale-free parameters, NX and NY, and showed that mouse and monkey actually span the same region of that parameter space, showing that they're responding to the same type of structure uh, out in the visual scene, just at this different length scale. So at the time, this was very encouraging uh, for the use of uh, studying uh, uh, visual cortex in the mouse. If they're responding to similar stimuli in the scene, then uh, potentially they're using similar cortical mechanisms to be able to calculate this. Uh, also says something probably about the nature of uh, natural scenes that mouse and monkey, even though they're working at this different resolution, are pulling out similar structure. But as I mentioned here, you know, these two scale bars are very different. If I plot the mouse and monkey receptive fields on the same scale bar, uh, you can see how vastly different mouse and uh, primate vision is. Uh, mice have much larger receptive fields. They're going to be responding to much coarser uh, information on the visual scene. And so this raises the question of what kinds of behavior can this support? What does a mouse actually do with these really large receptive fields? And obviously, it's not going to be the types of things that we do with our high acuity vision, for example, recognizing faces or fine structure from a distance, but maybe relates to the type of the things that we actually do, for example, with our peripheral vision, being able to move through and orient uh, in our environment. So that was one of the questions uh, that had kind of come out of these early studies. What kinds of behaviors do these receptive fields uh, support? Another was another finding, actually, that George mentioned in his introduction, uh, which occurred when we started looking at uh, responses in the wake mouse. Um, this was around the time that David Tank's lab had developed uh, the mouse on a ball preparation that's probably familiar to many people now. Uh, we have a styrofoam ball floating on air. Uh, we have a head plate holding the mouse's head in place, electrode going down into visual cortex. Uh, there would be a computer monitor over here where we can present visual stimuli. And you can see that the animal kind of spontaneously alternates between periods of sitting still and running. We actually went into this uh, aiming to look at differences between 
anesthetize an awake state. But we quickly realized there was a really big difference even within the awake state between these periods when the animal was sitting still and moving. An example of this is shown here. Uh, so this is repeated trials showing the same visual stimulus, a grading stimulus, uh, over and over again, a time along this axis. And you can see that this neuron fire spikes on every presentation of the stimulus. But if we color code it by the periods when the mouse was sitting still in red versus moving in blue, you can see that this neuron fired about twi twice as many spikes when the animal was moving versus when it was sitting still. So the firing rate went way up when the mouse started moving. Uh, this was true of the majority of neurons that we recorded in layer two, three. Uh, there was relatively little change in the spontaneous rate, but roughly a doubling of the visually evoked response with relatively little change in orientation selectivity. So this looked like a gain modulation, basically doubling the firing rate without changing uh, the stimuli that the neurons are responding to. They're basically just kind of turning up the volume on their visual system uh, when they started moving. Uh, since this time, we've learned a lot more about this effective movement uh, on visual processing. Uh, uh, Anne Churchland's lab and a number of other labs have shown how widespread these movement signals are. Uh, in fact, even during a visual task, the uninstructed movements dominate uh, activity and cortex beyond either the visual stimulus or the uh, movements that the animal has been instructed to make. Uh, Alex Huck's lab has uh, looked at the effects of movement in the marmoset visual cortex, a primate, uh, and found uh, related, uh, but it actually has in many ways strikingly different effects of movement uh, in the marmoset uh, visual cortex. Uh, we and others have looked at some of the neural circuits that mediate this, uh, in particular, uh, finding a circuit that starts off down the brainstem at the mesencephalic locomotor region, uh, which on one hand sends uh, projections down to the reticulospinal neurons that can drive movement, and then another projection up to the basal forebrain, which then sends a cholinergic input up to cortex, which can mediate this increase uh, in gain uh, up, in, up in cortex. So what we've learned a lot more kind of uh, descriptive information about the types of changes that occur with movement and how widespread they are. Uh, we've learned a little bit about the circuits that can mediate these changes. We're still kind of left with this question of, you know, why? What's the computational goal of turn, or what, what computational goal is the brain trying to achieve by turning up the gain in cortex? And we can make up some kind of just so stories, you know, for example, when the animal's sitting still, they're using hearing, when they're moving, they're using their vision. But without studying it in the context that vision is actually used, I think it's really where we kind of know what the computational goal is, it's really hard to say something specific about what these signals and these gain changes are being used for. So to summarize the kind of the two big questions that came out of our early studies is how do receptive fields get used to drive specific types of real world behaviors? And then what's the role of these movement signals in actual visual processing as an animal is moving through the world and trying to achieve something? I think these types of questions are really uh, challenging to address in the types of preparations that we typically use uh, in um, mouse visual neuroscience. And I actually should say in visual neuroscience in general, you know, this is a mouse on a ball, but it's very similar to a human in an fMRI looking at a screen. Um, and the reason that, you know, that these questions are challenging to address in those head fixed uh, preparations due to a are due to a number of limitations of those, uh, those paradigms. One of the most obvious is the disruption of the impact of movement. So if you're holding your head still, obviously you can't move in the natural way. And on the one hand, that means we don't know what the animal was trying to achieve by moving. Were they trying to run towards the screen? Were they trying to escape? Were they trying to do something else? But also we've disrupted the impact of movement on the incoming visual stimulus. So as you move forward in the world, the visual input changes in, partic particular, uh, in particular ways that are disrupted once the animal's head is held still um, and you're looking at images on a screen. Another limitation is the fact that we tend to use non-natural stimuli. So as visual neuroscientists, we like things like gratings and Gabor patches. Uh, but even if you show an image of a natural scene on a screen, that's very different than the type of you know, rich, you know, dynamic three-dimensional input or three-dimensional scene that we move through as we're interacting with the real world. And then finally, we tend to use non-natural behaviors. For example, having the mouse lick right or lick left in response to a visual stimulus. Uh, whether you know it's a horizontal or vertical grading, and as anybody who's trained mice in these kinds of behavior knows, uh, it can take you know several weeks to get a mouse to do even the most simple uh, visual discrimination. You know, they sit there every day, and all they have to do is look to the right in order to get their water reward when this comes up, and they don't make that connection. And what that suggests to me, that's you know that's not what the brain is wired up to do. You know, out in the world, a mouse never has to lick right when they see a vertical grading. Um, so it's not what the brain is wired to do when the mouse is, or a person is using their vision. 
It's a really good way, for instance, to be able to study learning. How do you form a new association between a stimulus and an action? Uh, it's a very good way to isolate cognitive aspects of decision making. But I would argue that's not what the brain evolved to use vision for. Although we're here on Zoom looking at two dimensional images on a screen, that's not what our brain evolved for. Our brain evolved to be able to move through the environment, interact with a rich dynamic visual scene, and perform specific types of behaviors. So while you might think, okay, well, we aren't using ideal stimuli, so we aren't going to get as many spikes, we aren't using an ideal behavior, so it takes you know longer to train them, I would argue that we might be missing a major uh, fraction of what the visual system actually evolved to do. A lot of the computations that the brain has to deal with, we just aren't tapping into in these head fix uh, uh, scenarios. So we'd be missing a lot of what the brain actually evolved to do. So these are the types of things that led us to be able to look at, or to want to look at vision in the context of natural behaviors. What types of behaviors does a mouse actually use its visual system for? Uh, so one thing that's been known is that mice uh, and uh, many species have a fear response. So for example, if a dark spot either looms or sweeps overhead, uh, the animal will freeze or flee in response to that. A uh, number of groups, Tiago Branco, uh, Sam Solomon, have done really nice work looking at the circuits that mediate that. Mice use their vision for navigation. So in the world, the mouse would have to be able to use its vision to find its way uh, back home. Uh, I also like to point out that uh, in the lab, one of the most common uh, tasks that people do with mice, uh, the Morris water maze, even though it's often thought of as a learning and memory task, is actually a visual task because the animals have to use the distal cues in the environment to remember where that platform is, the hidden platform is. Uh, so mice use their vision for navigation. My postdoc, Jen, uh, was wondering if our mice uh, would also use vision to be able to perform, perform prey capture. Uh, she was inspired by this species here. Uh, this is the grasshopper mouse. It's actually quite distantly related uh, to our lab, uh, C57 black six mice. Um, and it's often described as being specialized for a carnivorous lifestyle. So the grasshopper mouse can catch insects, uh, scorpions, frogs. Uh, it has big claws and big teeth. You know, it looks like a carnivore. And Jen was wondering if our lab mice would also perform prey capture. And I said, no way, <laughs> our lab mice are inbred. You know, they've never seen an insect or a living, thing in their, you know, a, a living thing in their cage in their life. Um, they just eat these little pellets that we drop in for them to eat. Uh, but Jen did the simplest test of just dropping a cricket into the cage. Uh, sure enough, the mouse chases and catches a cricket. And so she was off and running in terms of setting this up into a, a standardized uh, behavioral paradigm. Uh, so the setup she developed is shown here. We have a white arena with the mouse and the cricket. Uh, we do a little bit of habituation first. So if you just put a mouse in a white arena, the first thing that they do is they run and hide in the corner. So we have to get them used to being in a lit arena with an experimenter looking overhead. Uh, she also food deprives them for a little while just so that they're a little bit hungry. Uh, turns out they actually will hunt crickets even if they aren't hungry, but they don't really kind of do it on demand the way we'd like to for a, a nice behavioral paradigm. But once they're habituated to the environment and they're a little bit hungry, uh, we get behavior that looks like this. So once the mouse sees the cricket, it makes that beeline direct to the cricket's location. So you, see, you can see again there, these straight paths towards the cricket. Uh, the mouse isn't quite as good at catching the cricket when it gets there. Um, that's maybe where some of these specializations for the carnivorous lifestyle come into play. Um, uh, they don't have the big teeth and claws to be able to catch it, uh, but it actually turns out to be uh, to our advantage. Uh, you can kind of think of this, as I'll show you in a minute, you know, they need vision to be able to do these long distance approaches. Each time the cricket gets away, it's kind of like starting over another trial. If the mouse got to the cricket, caught it, and ate it, it'd be done in two seconds. That's not very much data. But we can get the equivalent of something like 10 to 15 trials out of one cricket, because each time the cricket escapes, you know, the process starts over again. Okay, so, you know, our mice can actually catch crickets, even though they've never seen them in their life. Uh, but are they actually using vision to do this? Uh, Jen did a series of sensory manipulations. Uh, so she started off uh, by deafening the animals, uh, putting in earplugs. Definitely uh, some uh, controls for this. I'm happy to talk about uh, more later. Uh, when she deafened the animals, you can see that they're still able to make that direct approach to the cricket's location. They go straight towards where the cricket is from all the way across the arena. So they don't need hearing to be able to uh, detect the cricket. On the other hand, uh, if she puts them in the dark or under IR so we can still film them, you can see the mouse really doesn't even realize the cricket's there, it just wanders right past its location. A part of that's because crickets don't actually make that much noise when they're on their own. Uh, they actually suppress their chirping in the presence of a predator. 
Uh, but once the mouse knows that the cricket's there, bumps into it, it's able to chase it and catch it. So it's still able to pursue the cricket. Uh, and we think that when the animal's close up, it's able to use some of these auditory cues, but that it needs vision to be able to do these long distance approaches uh, to where the cricket is. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, th th these, uh, you know, it, just looking at these videos, you can kind of tell that they're using vision to do this. Uh, but what we'd like to be able to do is be able to quantify this in the same way that we're used to doing in visual psychophysics. Can we calculate something that looks like a psychometric curve uh, for, um, uh, uh, for a mouse uh, chasing a cricket? And, you know, as George uh, mentioned, I actually started off in physics. Um, when I moved into neuroscience, I really, you know, things like a two AFC seem very nice. They're very controlled. We have signal detection theory, lots of analysis tools to be able to analyze it. Now we have a cricket, a mouse running around in a cage, chasing a cricket with these kind of crazy trajectories. How are we going to get something out of this that looks like a psychometric curve that we would like, um, you know, in order to be able to do quantitative analysis of the behavior? So Jen actually did a number of different types of quantification. Uh, the one I'm going to show you here, I really like because it tells us several things that we had wondered about mouse vision. Uh, but now uh, tested in the context of this ethological behavior. Uh, so this plot here is showing uh, the uh, angle between the mouse's head uh, and the cricket. So basically how accurately is it aimed towards the cricket as a function of how far away it is from the cricket. So first thing off is these two curves up here are when the animal's in the dark. So when the animal's in the dark, the animal it basically never starts aiming towards a cricket, only is able to pursue it when it happens to bump into it. So they need vision to be able to do this accurate orienting from a distance. If we then look at the distance where they start uh, targeting, uh, you can see here that right around 15 centimeters or so, the animal starts aiming towards the cricket's location. So this tells us something about the distance over which the animal, uh, the mouse's visual system works. As I mentioned in the beginning, they have these really large receptive fields. So you can imagine that that might be good for seeing large things at a distance, like landmarks, or small things that are close up. But this tells us that mice can also use their vision over this in intermediate range of 15, uh, 10 to 15 centimeters as well. Uh, likewise, at a distance of 15 centimeters, cricket is about one centimeter across. So this equates to about five degrees of visual angle. So this tells us approximately what the size of a stimulus is that the mouse can detect. Uh, to first order, you know, five degrees is roughly the size of a receptive field, uh, a retinal ganglion cell uh, receptive fields. And so this tells us the mouse is able to use that information that's available out in the retina and convert that into detecting and beginning an approach uh, to the cricket's location. And then finally, uh, when the animal is up close and pursuing the cricket, they're able to aim to within about plus or minus 10 degrees. So this tells us something about the accuracy of their sensory motor system. They're able to take that visual information coming in from the retina and convert it to a motor output that keeps the mouse aimed within plus or minus 10 degrees of the cricket's location, even while the cricket's able, uh, trying uh, to escape the mouse. So it tells us about the accuracy of their approach. Altogether, what I like about this is it's a way for us to be able to quantify the mouse's behavior. We can now go and look for changes with these, uh, in these curves as we do different types of manipulations. So it gives us a way to, to measure what the mouse can see, but not just what can they see, but what types of information are they actually using to be able to drive their natural behavior. Um, so basically kind of like uh, giving that eye exam, but in the context of a real natural behavior. So now that we can quantify this behavior, uh, we've gone on to use prey capture uh, in several different ways, uh, two of which I'm just gonna mention briefly here. Uh, one of which was another uh, project that was done by Jen Hoy. I should mention Jen actually has her own lab out at University of Nevada in Reno now. In fact, uh, just got tenure recently. Congratulations, Jen. Um, and I should mention, uh, she's also in particular looking at the development of this type of behavior. So if you're interested in that, I definitely recommend checking out Jen's lab. Uh, before she left uh, University of Oregon, uh, she did another set of experiments with prey capture uh, looking at the role of different superior colliculus cell types. In particular, she was interested in these two cell types uh, here, uh, the wide field vertical neurons and narrow field vertical neurons. Uh, these neurons had been known actually going back to Ramonica Hall, who first described their anatomy. A number of groups had looked at their electrophysiological properties, uh, receptive fields, their projection patterns, and so on. But we didn't know what these neurons actually get used for in the context of natural vision. So Jen used a chemogenetic approach, uh, shut down these two different cell types, and found that the wide field vertical neurons that have really big receptive fields were primarily involved in detecting uh, the presence of the cricket and initiating pursuit. Kind of consistent, if you have a large receptive field, you might be very good at detecting that something's out there, but not necessarily localizing it. On the other hand, these narrow field vertical neurons, 
uh, that have much smaller dendritic arbors, smaller receptive fields, when she shut them down, it disrupted the animal's ability to accurately target and drive an approach towards the cricket's location. So consistent with small receptive fields that are gonna be very good at localizing, we had corresponding uh, impacts on the behavior. So to me, what was really nice about Jen's study is we were able to take these two cell types that have been known for a long time. We knew a lot about their anatomy and uh, functional properties, but we didn't really know the logic of when they would get engaged in a behavior. And in the end, we need something like prey capture that has these phases of detection and then orienting to reveal the logic of uh, the role of these two different cell types. Probably wouldn't actually fall out if we were just doing a head fixed uh, to alternative force choice task. But in the context of natural behavior, the roles become obvious. Uh, the other study uh, that we've uh, done, uh, this was led by Angie McKell, uh, who is a grad student in the lab, uh, shown up here. Um, so Angie was interested in what mice look at. This is kind of another question going back in mouse vision. Uh, mice don't have a fovea. So the question is, you know, what are they, you know, how are they going to move their eyes? Are they going to look at, you know, things of interest? Uh, and of course, the problem before is we didn't know what a mouse might want to look at. But in the context of prey capture, we have some idea that probably they want to be looking at the cricket, at least when they're actively pursuing it. And so she is able to study their eye movements in the context of a particular target in the visual scene. Uh, Angie set up a set of head-mounted uh, eye cameras. In fact, she's shown up here uh, showing the, the human equivalent of uh, eye tracking cameras. Uh, I should mention this is similar to an approach that was developed by Jasper Port and actually my next door neighbor here at UO, uh, Mike Weir, around the same time. Uh, so she put on a set of head-mounted uh, eye cameras on the mouse to look and see where they're looking when the animal's uh, performing prey, prey capture. Uh, first thing she found is when the animal's sitting still, they don't saccade around to look at the world, so they don't do targeted saccades to the cricket's location. Kind of makes sense if you don't have a fovea, you don't necessarily need to foveate onto something. But what she did, oh, what she did find is that they tended to aim towards the cricket uh, with their head. Kind of makes sense if you want to pursue something, you're going to aim your head towards it. But as they move their head, you know, for example, as a mouse sweeps its head to aim towards a cricket, the eyes performed a very uh, stereotype pattern, actually termed uh, saccade and fixate uh, by my, uh, the late Michael Land uh, from uh, here at Sussex, um, who described this uh, pattern as saccade and fixate. Essentially what the, mouth, what the eyes do is as the head is moving one way, uh, presumably uh, eye move, compensatory eye movements that are probably driven by the VOR, uh, move the eyes in the opposite direction. So it stabilizes the scene. You move your head one way, the eyes move the opposite way to stabilize everything. And once the eyes have moved to a certain distance within their range, they're going to jump back and catch up with the eyes. So when you put, or catch up with the head. So if we put this together, we get this pattern here. Again, this is what Michael Land called uh, saccade and fixate. You get these abrupt jumps in gaze interspersed by periods of stabilization. So in the mouse, the eyes aren't, you know, jumping around like a, a primate would to saccade to a particular location. The animal is moving its head towards that location and the eyes movement serve to stabilize and then catch up with the head movements. So again, the nice thing here was we were able to look at eye movements, not in the kind of arbitrary case of a head fixed subject looking at the screen, but actually within the context of an animal pursuing prey to see how they naturally move their eyes. So based on the success of using prey capture to look at different types of visual processing from cell types uh, and colliculus to eye movements, a big push in the lab recently has been to take other aspects of visual processing and cast them into this ethological context. Uh, the one I want to tell you about now um, was developed by uh, Phil Parker. Uh, Phil was a postdoc in the lab. Uh, he actually just recently started his own lab at Rutgers. Uh, so again, if you're interested in any of this, definitely check out his lab. Uh, so Phil was interested in studying depth perception, uh, but not depth perception from you know, the point of stereo vision, you know, the disparity between the two eyes uh, that many of us are familiar with, but depth perception from motion parallax. Uh, this is the phenomenon that's probably uh, familiar to many of you, as you move your head side to side, objects that are far away are going to appear to move just a little bit, and objects that are close up are going to move a lot. Uh, in fact, this is a very strong cue for depth in humans as well. If you cover one eye, um, everything kind of goes flat, and you move side to side, uh, things start to pop out in depth. But for us, what's uh, interesting about this is that it's a, it's a computation where we know what the, uh, or it's a behavior where we know what the computational goal is. And it combines movement on the one hand and vision on the other hand. And we know what we know what the computation is. You basically want to take the ratio of head movement and visual movement to calculate a distance. So we have a context now where we know, presumably, what the movement signals are being used for. And we might be able to track them, uh, track down um, both the circuitry and the computations that are being performed. 
However, uh, we need to have a task where the animal is actually using, performing distance estimation and might be using motion parallax to do this. Uh, Phil was inspired by some old studies uh, by Mel Goodale, uh, who was looking at Mongolian gerbils and showed that the gerbils could jump across gaps of different distances and suggested that they were using motion parallax to be able to do that. Uh, so Phil set up a task for the mice uh, to jump across uh, gaps of different distances. As uh, shown here, uh, we don't think the mice actually really have to learn how to jump. Anyone who's chased a mouse around the lab or at home uh, knows they're pretty good at, at jumping across things. Uh, they just need to know that it's worth their effort to do so. And he does that by giving them a little food reward here. Uh, but once they know uh, what they need to do to get their food, you can see that they can actually jump across uh, pretty impressive distances, up to 20 to 25 uh, centimeters. Um, and of course, because this is uh, further than the distance that they could use whiskers or tactile cues to be able to do this, uh, we assume that they're using a vision to be able to estimate that distance. You might have noticed that right before the mouse jumps, it does that little head bob up and down. And that's what Mel Goodale had suggested that creates the motion parallax cue that allows them to estimate the distance. So once uh, Phil had the mice trained on this task, uh, like Jen, he was able to come back and quantify this in different ways. Uh, so we track the animal's position. You can see here um, that they're usually quite successful at jumping uh, to the edge of the platform. Uh, sometimes they jump a little short or sometimes uh, they jump far. But based on this, he's able to, again, quantify their behavior, calculate something that looks kind of like a psychometric curve. So for example, here, this is the distance across the gap versus how far they jumped. So you can see that they do this quite accurately. They don't, for example, take a strategy of just jumping as far as they can every time, but at least on average, uh, they jump accurately. He also wanted to test whether they're using uh, monocular cues, uh, such as motion parallax, or whether they're using binocular cues, uh, or whether they require binocular cues, uh, such as stereo vision disparity to be able to do this. So he did the very simplest manipulation. He just covered one eye of the mouse and showed that the mouse was, uh, there, there was almost an imperceptible impact uh, on the performance of the task when they were working with one eye versus two eyes. Uh, showing that they're able to use monocular cues, they don't require binocular vision to be able to estimate distance, and suggesting that they might be using motion parallax. Uh, Phil did a number of other different types of quantification, for example, uh, the frequency of different types of head movements and monocular binocular conditions, uh, looking at the role of visual cortex. Uh, I won't talk about those today, but as I mentioned, uh, if you're interested in it, you should definitely check out Phil's work. He's also going to be looking at some of the circuit mechanisms that mediate this uh, in his own lab. Uh, so for us, again, this was a nice uh, approach to take something with a you know, known visual computation. We know that estimating distance is a very important thing that our visual system does. And there's multiple ways of doing it, not just stereo vision, but also things like motion parallax. In particular, some of these other computations are based on combining movement and vision in interesting ways. That's some of our work on behaviors, uh, uh, first prey capture and, um, motion par and then motion parallax. Uh, now I want to switch over to talking about measuring neural coding during these types of free movement behaviors. And some of you might have already realized that it's kind of a confound here. So, you know, um, how are we going to study what neurons are responding to? What are the visual stimuli that a neuron is responding to as a mouse is either chasing a cricket around, jumping across gaps, and so on? That's because, you know, the fundamental thing that we do in visual neuroscience, as I showed you at the beginning, beginning of my talk, is we present a visual stimulus we record the activity in the brain, and then we relate those two to each other. Now in these natural behavior paradigms, we're no longer presenting the visual stimulus. The mouse is looking wherever it wants. And not only can it kind of aim its head wherever it wants, but as you saw a minute ago, their eyes are moving around as well. So we need to be able to know what's the actual visual input that the mouse is seeing in order to do something like calculating receptive fields. Uh, so Phil uh, and a team of excellent uh, uh, techs in the lab set up a really nice system to be able to do exactly this. Uh, it's based on a set of head-mounted cameras. Uh, we have one camera uh, we call the world camera that looks out at the world and see, shows the scene from the mouse's perspective, kind of like a little miniature GoPro. We have another camera that's aimed back at the mouse's eye so that we can see where they're looking within that scene. Uh, we have a silicon probe uh, that allows us to record on the order of 100 neurons at a time. And then we can put all of this together and measure the responses as an animal is freely moving uh, through uh, a natural environment, or, or through a, uh, not, a, not a purely natural environment, but moving through a three-dimensional environment as opposed to being head fixed. So this is what it looks like when we put it all together. 
So you can see here, this is the view uh, from the mouse's perspective. Uh, this is their pattern of eye movements. You can kind of see, almost see there, these uh, saccade and fixate movements. Up here, you can see the trace of the animal's eye position. Uh, this is the tilt of their head. Uh, this is the activity of about 120 neurons. Uh, you can probably already see here that there's a big change uh, in the pattern of activity from the animal sitting still uh, here at the beginning uh, to when the animal's moving over here. And this was really, you know, for me for a long time, this has been kind of the dream data set. Going back to when we found the effects of movement, I was always wondering, like, what's going on in the mouse's brain when they're actually moving through their environment? Now we have this data, but the challenge is, how are we going to make sense of it? And there's really two challenges associated with this. One of which is, even though we have the world cam video that see, shows us the scene in front of the mouse's head, we need to compensate for the mouse's eye movements. We basically need to shift that in an appropriate way. We need to essentially calibrate this eye tracking in order to uh, infer the actual input that's landing on the retina as the eye is moving around that visual scene. Another challenge is that these visual scenes that you see here, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, of the, the, when we're doing spike triggered average uh, receptive field mapping, is based on a lot of assumptions about the visual scene. You know, it has to be Gaussian and so on. And real scenes break almost all of those assumptions. They're very strong spatial and temporal correlations. So a simple receptive field mapping like a spike triggered average isn't going to work here. <clears throat> so how are we going to make sense of all this data? A really uh, brave uh, grad student in the lab, uh, Elliot Abe, who's now moved on to a postdoc up, uh, up at UW, uh, took on uh, this challenge. And it just remind you that these two challenges, how do we calibrate that eye tracking in order to shift the image to compensate for what's actually landing on the retina? And then how do we re estimate receptive fields uh, from this highly non-Gaussian stimulus? And Elliot came up with a way, and I should mention this was uh, inspired by some work from uh, Jake Yates uh, and Jude Mitchell's lab, who worked out this uh, shifter network approach. But what uh, Elliot ended up doing is solving these two problems kind of in one fell swoop. So he takes, uh, trains one, uh, uh, he used a, a machine learning approach, basically two, uh, not deep networks, two shallow networks, one of which uh, learns a mapping from the mouse's eye position to an appropriate set of shifts of the uh, world cam image to approximate what's landing on the retina itself. Then based on that shifted image, he has another uh, shallow network, a two layer network, that functions like a generalized linear model to be able to estimate receptive fields. And of course, like a GLM, the weights of this network are going to be the spatial receptive field of the neuron's response. So training these two together, it essentially learns the mapping of eye movements to shifts that allows you to uh, extract, uh, to be able to predict neural activity and extract receptive fields uh, uh, for each individual neuron. I should mention we train this about, for about 100 or 120 neurons at a time. So we aren't fitting this shifter network for each neuron. We're fitting it basically for the geometry of the current uh, head-mounted camera configuration. Okay, so does this actually work? Uh, kind of remarkably, yes. Uh, we can get receptive fields out uh, that look much like I showed you at the beginning of my talk. And so, for example, here we have an elongated uh, off receptive field, edge between light and dark, you know, nice Gabor-like receptive fields, and so on. Uh, so not only do we get uh, receptive fields out, but we can actually do a decent job of predicting uh, neural activity as well. I should mention that this is smooth over the time course of about one second. So we're estimating kind of the general changes and responses as the animal is looking at different points within its visual scene as it's move, uh, freely moving through the environment. Uh, for the best neurons, we can actually do uh, pretty well up to a correlation coefficient of about 0.6. And on average, we get a correlation coefficient of about 0.3 between the measured neural activity and our predictions uh, from the network here. So I mentioned that these look like the receptive fields we measured in head fixed uh, uh, conditions. Uh, Phil and Elliot went back and actually did the direct test. So they record uh, activity uh, in a head fixed mouse showing our standard Gaussian noise stimulus. Then move the neuron, uh, move the animal over into the arena, uh, record from the same neurons as they're moving through the environment and estimate receptive fields uh, uh, from, this, uh, from the actual visual input that the mouse is seeing. I should mention straight off that there's a large number of neurons that either only have a receptive field in the head fixed conditions or only have a receptive field in the freely moving conditions. Probably a lot of that, you know, there's huge differences between these two. Uh, there's the change in the visual stimulus from Gaussian to a, a real three dimensional world. And likewise, a change in the behavioral conditions from a head fixed animal to an animal that's freely moving. So we think those contribute to a lot of what's uh, different between those two. Um, 
But for the neurons that did have receptive fields in both conditions, they actually ended up matching up quite nicely. So you can see that the neurons, the receptive fields are in a similar location, similar polarity, similar uh, orientation. And in fact, when we compared them at the pixel wise level, so not, not just at the, you know, did they have the same orientation, but pixel by pixel, we actually found a relatively high correlation coefficient. So for those that had a significant uh, match, uh, in, in both conditions, uh, the correlation coefficient was on uh, an average of about 0.3. So these two end up matching up quite well. <clears throat> I should mention, of course, there were a large number of units that don't have receptive fields in one condition or the other. And particularly for those that had receptive field in the freely moving condition uh, versus not the head fix, we're kind of interested in what's different about, about those two. What is it in the free moving condition that allows you to map these receptive fields that you can't map them uh, under head fix conditions? Um, and while this is really, you know, reassuring in terms of the fact that at least, you know, some of the neurons are similar, you know, for example, we aren't just pulling out some kind of artifact uh, from our uh, deep uh, learning approach. I think what's really nice about this is it, it now allows us to go in and study things that we couldn't have studied at all during uh, head fix conditions. So, you know, this doesn't, you know, tell us that, you know, we could have just done all of our experiments head fix because there's a whole range of things that we simply can't do in the head fix condition. For example, uh, the prey capture, I showed you that these two types of neurons, uh, when we shut one down, uh, it impacted detection. When we shut the other one down, it disrupted orienting. But now we can actually go back and we can record during the behavior and say, did the one set of cells fire when the animal detected the cricket? And did the other set fire, uh, other set of neurons fire when they were orienting? And did it, uh, were they firing in a way that corresponded with localizing and approaching the cricket's location? Likewise, we can look at types of modulations that wouldn't be present in head fixed. For example, is there a shift in the type of processing that occurs when an animal is just exploring its environment versus when it's doing a goal uh, directed behavior, such as trying to find the cricket? So there's a whole range of types of things we want to do with this going forward, particularly looking at mapping receptive fields during different types of behaviors. Uh, one of the first things we did was actually just going back to one of the basic findings about uh, head movements. In fact, a couple of groups recently had shown that in mouse visual cortex, when the animal moves its head, that there's very strong signals associated with that head movement. But we wanted to go back and look at this now in the context of a head and eye movements together. As I showed you earlier, uh, Angie and her uh, experiments with eye tracking during prey capture showed that mice do this very distinctive and kind of universal pattern of eye movements, the saccade and fixate. So sometimes when they move their head, the eyes are compensating, so the visual scene won't change. And sometimes when they move their head, there's a saccade to jump to a new location. And so we wanted to see if there was a difference between those two types of head movements, when the eyes are, are compensating versus when the eyes are saccading to catch up. So uh, uh, Phil, uh, together with these two outstanding techs, uh, Emmeline and Dylan, uh, Emmeline and uh, Dylan have both gone on to grad school now. Uh, so keep an eye out for uh, their upcoming work. Uh, so they went in and they recorded using our head mounted system, looking at the uh, times when an animal moves its head and dividing these up into the times when there's a saccade that shifts the gaze versus when the eyes compensate so the gaze and the visual scene stays the same. And what they found was quite striking. So this is one example neuron. You can see that there's a very strong uh, response when the animal makes a gaze shift in red here and almost no response when the animal's eyes move to compensate for the movement of the head. Uh, this was true across almost all of the units that we recorded. Uh, we saw different uh, patterns of response to the gaze shifts. Uh, here it's a biphasic response, here it's a negative response, but almost no response uh, to when the uh, mouse's uh, eyes compensated for the head movements. So not all head movements are equal. The head movements when the eyes shift the gaze drive a strong response, and the head movements when the eyes compensate um, uh, don't drive a response, suggesting that there's something about this change in visual input that occurs when you have a gaze shift that might be driving these very strong responses here. This is just showing the summary. This is all neurons uh, looking at the response to the gaze shift when the visual input changes and almost no response when the eyes compensate. So there's no change in the visual input coming in. So we spent a while you know, analyzing those different types of responses. I showed you a minute ago, we get some of these uh, that are you know, positive, biphasic, and negative. Uh, we started off using a clustering approach where we divide these into early and po late positive, biphasic, and negative. But because we had a large population of them, when we average these clusters, you can see that they almost form this kind of progression from the early to the later, to the biphasic, to the negative. So what we did is we took this classification, went back to our original data, and uh, sorted our units appropriately. So this is about 100 neurons we recorded simultaneously. Each of these little arrows is one of these saccades or gaze shifts. 
And you can see that after each of these gaze shifts, you basically get this ripple of activity across the population. And if we hadn't sorted the units based on these you know, waveforms here, we wouldn't be able to see this ripple of activity. It would just look like all of them are responding at random times. But based on this, we're able to now sort them and see that we get this temporal sequence going across the population. In fact, you can see this here. This is the whole population of units that we recorded, uh, that some of them have this very early positive response, then leading into a, a negative followed by positive or biphasic response, and then a relatively small population that had a purely negative response uh, to a gaze shift. So they mentioned, you know, because these are um, <clears throat> these uh, responses occur uh, primarily when the eyes are jumping to a new location, so you're getting new visual input coming in, it's suggested that they're driven by that change in visual input. If that's true, then we should, uh, then these patterns should disappear when the animal's in the dark. So uh, Phil and Dylan and Emmeline did exactly that experiment. Uh, they recorded units as the animal's moving through the arena in the light, and then shifted over uh, to put the animal in the dark. And you can see that there is a small set of neurons that respond in both conditions, uh, these early ones here. We think these probably represent a pure motor signal. They maintain a head movement signal even in the dark. They probably represent the true uh, head movement. But the rest of this temporal sequence basically disappears, gets converted over to a mild uh, suppression. Uh, we think that may be consistent uh, with saccade suppression. But overall, this temporal sequence that we see is eliminated in the dark suggesting that this, the sequence is driven by visual input. If it's being driven by visual input, then what are these neurons responding to? So uh, we went back into kind of the classic uh, tuning properties uh, by measuring, you know, again, first in the free moving animal, and then in head fixed animal, this looking at uh, drifting sin where we're presenting drifting sinusoidal gratings of different spatial and temporal frequencies. Over here, you can see that temporal sequence that we saw before. When we sorted, sorted the neurons based on their latency uh, response following a gaze shift, and looked at their preferred spatial frequency, you can see that we see a shift from the earliest neurons responding to low spatial frequencies to the later neurons responding to a broad range of higher spatial frequencies. So the first neurons that respond are responding to low spatial frequencies, the coarse information in the visual scene, and later neurons are responding to the full range of spatial frequencies, capturing the fine information in the visual scene. In fact, this is a type of processing that actually been described going back to Amar and his primal sketch, um, known as coarse defined processing, a number of groups, Dario Ringach and others, uh, had shown this in head fixed animals, uh, including both primates and mice. But now we're seeing that this uh, pattern of course defined processing, going from the broad information to the fine detail in a scene, occurs each time the animal shifts its gaze. Uh, you might think that this is just a mouse thing. They have low uh, acuity vision anyways. Um, so to test this, uh, we actually teamed up with Jake Yates and Jude Mitchell, who were doing similar experiments uh, in the marmoset. Here it was actually a head fixed marmoset, but it was free to gaze within a natural scene. Once they sorted their data the same way that we did, uh, they saw the same temporal sequence in the marmoset. And likewise, when they looked at the spatial frequency tuning properties, they saw this same progression from low to higher spatial frequencies. So together, this shows that you know, even though mice and marmosets have very different uh, behavioral repertoires, very different visual scenes, very different types of eye movements, the ones we look at just these, uh, this kind of shared context of gaze shift versus compensatory movements, we see the same type of uh, temporal sequence and a similar computational motif, of course, defined across these two different species. So both mouse and marmoset have this course defined processing, which is kind of nice to see that, you know, this is, you know, given that saccade and fixate is such a universal phenomenon, that the corresponding computational uh, mechanisms are similar as well or the computational implications are similar as well. Uh, in addition to kind of showing us something about, you know, the shared uh, processing across species, for me, this was really insightful and in really pointing out how important it is to know what the actual visual input that an animal experiences is. So, you know, typically in visual neuroscience, we either flash an image on a screen or we play continuous movies. But as you can see, this is the, the visual scene that's been corrected for the animal's eye movements. And you can see that rather than being either a static image or a continuous movie, it's basically a series of clips that are driven by the eye movements. The eyes stabilize, you get a brief movie, and then you jump to a new location. And each of those jumps results in one of these uh, sequences, of course, to find processing. So it's only by knowing the true uh, visual input that occurs during natural behavior that, we, that this computational principle emerges. So to wrap up our part on uh, natural vision in the mouse, I've talked about some of the ethological tasks uh, that we've developed. 
that can give us some insight into visual function, the types of cues that the animal is extracting from the visual scene, what they can use it for. And then likewise, I talked about how we've implemented freely moving rec uh, recordings that can reveal aspects of neural coding during active vision to be able to allow us to map receptive fields during behaviors and to see computational principles that emerge resulting from the patterns of movements that an actual animal actually makes during active vision. Okay. I think I may have used up a lot of my time, but if it's okay with George, I will proceed to spend a few minutes telling you about our latest work uh, looking at visual processing uh, in the octopus. Uh, so this was a project that was brought to the lab uh, by Judith Pangor, a postdoc in the lab, who essentially came to me with the challenge, can we record visual responses in the octopus's visual system? Uh, when she brought this problem to me, I kind of got immediately hooked. Uh, it's one of these, you know, for visual neuroscience, kind of irresistible questions. Um, so uh, cephalopods uh, diverged uh, from uh, vertebrates over 700 million years ago, diverged from other uh, uh, invertebrates 500 million years ago. Despite this evolutionary distance, cephalopods such as octopus evolved a camera-like eye remarkably similar to ours with a lens and iris uh, forms an image on the back of the eye, a high resolution image. Cephalopods have a remarkable range of visual behaviors they can do everything from you know, the types of things that you know, mice does, like prey capture and navigation, to pretty remarkable things, such as the ability to analyze the visual scene based on the polarization angle of light, or to camouflage themselves based on the visual scene. But they do all of this with a brain that's completely different from the vertebrate brain, at least you know, uh, the, the overt organization. Uh, there's no visual cortex, there's no thalamus, and so on. In fact, almost all of the visual processing is thought to occur uh, in these large optic lobes, Optic lobes make up about two thirds of the uh, cephalopod central brain. So I often compare that, you know, in contrast to mouse, where there's, you know, one or two uh, millimeters of uh, cortex devoted to visual processing, two thirds of the octopus brain is devoted to vision. So despite, you know, kind of how amazing their visual uh, behaviors and um, capabilities are, um, and this, you know, remarkably uh, unusual brain, there's been very few studies of visual processing within the central brain itself. So I often compare this to vertebrates, you know, even though there's a lot that we're still learning about vision, we know the basic pathways, we know the, the pathway from thalamus up to cortex and higher visual areas, we know roughly what types of uh, uh, information and transformations are occurring at each of these stages. Uh, likewise, for the insect brain and particularly Drosophila. Uh, in the cephalopod, there's never been a recording of visual responses beyond the photoreceptors themselves. So we don't know what neurons in the optic lobe respond to. We don't know how that information gets transformed across the layers of the optic lobe. And we don't know what information goes out to different uh, downstream brain areas that might mediate uh, some of these different types of visual behaviors. <clears throat> so this was the challenge that Judith came to lab with. Can we record uh, from the, uh, the optic lobes of the octopus? Now, a uh, number of groups had tried to do electrophysiological recordings, which had been quite challenging for a number of technical reasons. Uh, so Judith suggested that we use a calcium imaging approach. And also that we study this uh, in the juvenile octopus. Uh, I should mention our species, the octopus binoculoides. Uh, we study them when they're about one to two months old. Uh, so their body is about the size of a pea, about a centimeter across. Uh, their arms are five to 10 centimeters across. Uh, you can see one of our subjects here performing prey capture at feeding time. Uh, you can see kind of how remarkable uh, their uh, motor behavior is, reaching out with one arm to grab food, and a second here, the other arm is going to be exploring back into its home. Uh, but again, uh, one of the advantages of the juvenile is it makes these experiments much more accessible, uh, particularly for calcium imaging to be able to get into the optic lobes. So of course, the challenge uh, in uh, working with cephalopods is we don't have all of the genetic tools that are available in the mouse or Drosophila. Uh, we don't have pre-lines, we don't even have uh, viruses to be able to express things like GCAMP. So we actually had to go a little bit old school. We did an injection of a calcium indicator dye. Uh, we used Cal520. And we can inject this into the optic lobe and use that to measure visual responses. I should mention we have to do a bit of dissection to be able to get down to the optic lobe and to be able to uh, stabilize uh, the animal. Uh, but once they're immobilized in the uh, imaging chamber, we inject in the calcium indicator dye. We can present visual stimuli on the side of the imaging chamber uh, using a projector and get patterns of activity that look like this. Oh, sorry, the movie in the corner is not playing, but, um, but you can see we get these large scale patterns of activation at different areas uh, within the optic lobe. I should mention because we're doing this injection of a calcium indicator dye that fills the tissue, and also because in invertebrates, a lot of the activity is out in the neural processes in the neuropill. 
we aren't really quite at the level of getting a single unit activity. And so most of what we've been doing is looking at the large scale organization in terms of specific regions within the optic lobe, as opposed to single unit responses. But one of the things we're interested in looking at is what is the large scale organization? Are there things like topography, retinotopy? Are there segregated on and off uh, pathways? And in particular for topography, you know, we think of you know, almost all visual systems out there, although not all, some, for example, the turtle cortex don't have retinotopy. Most visual systems have a retinotopic organization. However, in the octopus, at least in the motor system, there have been suggestions that there's not a topographic map. There's not a somatotopic map uh, for motor control. And so the people have thought, well, maybe cephalopods don't actually use topographic organization as a computational principle. So that was one of the first things we wanted to look at. Is there retinotopy? So this is a response of uh, uh, the optic lobe here, the, um, uh, color coded in a heat map showing the response uh, to each stimulus to a spot on the left side of the monitor. And then as the spot moves over towards the center, you can see that, you know, first of all, the spot on the left side activates the left side of the optic lobe and it shifts over, we get localized, uh, but shifting patterns of activation, uh, suggesting a retinotopic organization. The response within the optic lobe depends on where the visual stimulus is and moves in a smooth progression. Uh, we went in to map receptive fields more carefully uh, using a relatively similar spike triggered average approach to what I described at the beginning. Uh, here we're using sparse noise <clears throat> so we can look at responses to, size, uh, to spots of different sizes, but it's the same basic idea. We present the sparse noise stimulus, we extract the activity at particular locations within the optic lobe, and then we can calculate the average response. Uh, this shows two such receptive field mappings. I should mention that we do this separately for the on, shown in red, and the off, shown in blue, so the light and dark spots in here. And you can see that we get, indeed, localized visual responses uh, within the optic lobe, responses to both light on and uh, light off uh, stimuli. So this is the first demonstration of receptive fields uh, within the uh, uh, cephalopod central brain. Now, what about retinotopic organization? How does the location of these receptive fields depend on the location within the optic lobe? So here we've taken each location that we measured. We've color coded it by the location of the uh, receptive field center. And you can see that we get this nice progression, both for the elevation and for the azimuth. So we have a retinotopic, a very clear uh, retinotopic organization. And it, this is true for both on and off stimuli. One thing I'll note here is we don't really get responses in the outer layers for the off stimuli. And we think that's because in the cephalopod, and as in uh, uh, pretty much all invertebrates, the photoreceptors respond to light onset in contrast to vertebrates where it's light uh, off drives them. So we think that in these outer layers here where the photoreceptor axons are coming in, we only have the on pathway being activated and the off pathway only emerges in the deeper layers, starting at the inner granular layer and then strengthening into the deeper layers, the medulla. So we have retinotopy and we have an on and off pathway. One of the things that was surprising that was different was when you actually looked at spatial integration in the on versus off pathway by showing spots of different sizes. So over here is a response to light spots of increasing size up to full field flash shown down here. And you can see as we increase the size of the spot, we get a decreased response within the optic lobe, consistent with lateral inhibition, surround suppression, uh, typical mechanisms. On the other hand, uh, when we showed dark spots, we got almost the opposite effect, a slight increase as the spots got larger. So overall, this is gonna lead to a shift from the neurons in the uh, optic lobe responding primarily to smaller dark stimuli, uh, so, sorry, smaller light stimuli versus larger uh, dark stimuli. Um, and we weren't sure what to make of this. It was actually Jose Manuel Alonso who studies on and off pathways uh, in the mammalian visual system who suggested this might have something to do with the properties of the visual scene underwater. Because water filters light, things that are far away, such as landmarks, are going to appear dark, whereas things that the animal is interested in close up, such as prey, might appear uh, light, would, uh, would be small, uh, small and light. Uh, so this suggests both the potentially a, a match to the visual scene, but very clear differences in the uh, mechanisms of processing for the on versus the off pathway. So we see some things that are conserved. So for example, retinotopy appears to be conserved, but there's differences in size selectivity uh, in the on and off pathways. So that's a bit about the responses of neurons in the visual system of the octopus. What about the circuitry? Uh, we realize if we're gonna be looking and you know, trying to figure out how the octopus visual system analyzes the scene in a way that we do, you know, similar to what we do in the mouse or people have done in the Drosophila, we're gonna to need to know a lot more about the cell types. And while we have some beautiful anatomical description of the cell types, uh, going back, actually Cajal originally looked at cephalopods uh, and J.Z. Young back in the 60s did a very detailed analysis of the optic lobe. 
So we have a really good understanding of the morphological cell types. We know almost nothing about these cell types in kind of the modern terms that we think about. Things like what neurotransmitters do they use? What receptors are they expressing? Or even things like, you know, the transcription factors that might allow us to get genetic access to them or that might define them during development. So in order to get that type of molecular information, uh, we took a single cell sequencing approach. I should mention this was a team effort. Uh, my colleagues, Adam Miller uh, here in um, at UO, uh, who's in the Institute of Neuroscience and Andy Kern in uh, ecology. Uh, we teamed up with a really great group of uh, students, staff scientists and postdocs, May, Denise, Gabby and Judith, to first do single cell sequencing to figure out what cell types are there to determine a taxonomy of the cell types. And then to go back into the visual, uh, back into the brain and say, where are each of these cell types located? Okay, so from the taxonomy, we were able to broadly define the cell types uh, based on the neurotransmitters that they used. Um, I should mention, you know, one of the things that we had been interested in is, you know, is the organization of the optic lobe going to be in some ways similar to that of the vertebrate retina? They have some morphological similarities. But what we found very quickly is that, you know, they're very different at the molecular level. The types of neurotransmitters, receptors, and so on that are used are completely different. So, for example, we found a very large population of neurons that express the markers for both dopamine and glutamate, a uh, very large dopaminergic population, uh, both cholinergic and glutamatergic neurons, uh, some populations that are uh, using uh, neuromodulators or neuropeptides, orchokinin and octopamine. So a very different array of neurotransmitters than is you know, thought of in, in the vertebrate retina. Uh, we also found this really large population of immature neurons. First, we thought these were just, you know, either junk reads or non-neuronal cells because they weren't expressing mature neurotransmitter phenotypes. But in looking at them more closely, we found that they expressed early markers of neurons. And this is actually, you know, not probably surprising in retrospect, the octopus or cephalopod brain in general continues to grow throughout its lifetime, uh, roughly doubling in size every few weeks. So we're going to have to have an influx of new neurons to be able to support that growth of the brain. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question. How do you have a set of immature neurons coming into the brain continually as the animals, you know, uh, already uh, fully active, interacting with its environment, basically through its entire lifetime, adding new neurons in? Okay. Um, so besides those immature neurons, we were able to break up the population of neurons based on these disjoint sets of neurotransmitter expression, dopamine, glutamate, and so on. I should mention one, another thing that was surprising about this. We didn't find any GABA. Uh, which at first was a little bit concerning until we found some old studies which said, suggested that there is indeed no GABA uh, in the optic lobe, uh, but also that it's thought that uh, the cholinergic transmission uh, may be uh, inhibitory in the optic lobe due to the presence of uh, anionic uh, acetylcholine receptors, so that perhaps glutamate and acetylcholine are doing that excitatory inhibitory balance uh, that we're used to in the vertebrate. We then went in to look to see where these different cell types were. I won't go into this in detail, but you can already see here there's a very different expression pattern uh, for the dopaminergic markers uh, versus glutamate, uh, acetylcholine, and so on, with dopamine being very strong in the um, input layers of the optic lobe, and then the deep optic lobe having kind of a mix of both acetylcholine um, uh, and glutamate. We could also go in and use these, divide up these cell types into much finer classes. Uh, based on other markers. So one of these, uh, 6345, is well known to be involved in visual system development uh, in other species, marks most of the outer granular layer here. And we could divide up that outer granular layer with other markers, things like different neuropeptides. This is an adhesion molecule, uh, DSCAM. So we're able to reveal a much more detailed organization of these layers that had previously been suspected based purely on anatomy as well as defining some of the interesting characteristics of these neurons. They're using specific uh, neuropeptides, as well as some of the molecules that might wire them up during development. So I want to finish. Uh, so we, we, oh, sorry, we were able to put this all together. So we have our taxonomy on the one hand, uh, and we have an atlas of the location within the optic lobe on the other hand. So now we have kind of a context to be able to interpret our imaging studies in terms of these cell types, both what cell types are there, and where are they located, and hopefully at some point be able to go in and do the same type of dissection of these circuits based on these cell types that we're able to do in other species. Uh, just to wrap up, one thing, you know, an example of a, what we found from this, and I think how it could be exciting for looking at visual function, is this one particular cell type out here. Uh, these express tyramine beta hydroxylase, uh, which is the uh, part of the synthetic pathway for octopamine, thought of as the invertebrate homologue of noradrenaline. It also expressed one specific protocadherin that might be responsible for wiring up this cell type. And when we went and did the in situ, you can see that it labeled this one specific cell type right around uh, the outside of the optic lobe. Uh, 
this is you know exciting. You know, on one hand, it shows that we have a very specific cell type that's spatially localized, but in particular, these are expressing octopamine. As I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, I started off by talking about these effects of locomotion on uh, visual processing in the mouse. A similar phenomenon had been found uh, in the fly and had been shown to be mediated by Michael Dickinson's lab uh, by octopaminergic signaling. And this suggests that maybe there's the same type of state dependent modulation that might be occurring at the input layers of the optic lobe as well. And now we have a cell type that might allow us to go in and probe for that. So to wrap up the octopus, uh, we're basically kind of continuing this pathway, recapitulating visual physiology and other species uh, by presenting different types of visual stimuli, moving towards natural scenes, things like polarization vision. And eventually we'd like to map this on to the transformations that occur at different layers, how this information gets sent to different parts of the visual system to mediate different types of behavior. So with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, thank all the people who did this work. I tried to acknowledge people uh, as I went along, uh, thank uh, collaborators and funding sources and happy to take uh, some questions. I have a feeling I went a bit over time, but hopefully uh, that's okay given the virtual format. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I would suggest, just so we appear bigger on people's screens, like if you could stop screen sharing for the time being and bring yeah. it up if there are questions relative to that. Um, so yeah, like it was amazing, like very holistic coverage and very detailed uh, experiments of what you uh, investigate both in mice and in octopi. Uh, let me go ahead and post the Zoom room link already and remind our audience that after a short moderation round here in the chat, uh, we will be continuing offline. So if you are interested, make sure to uh, follow the link that I just posted. So the first question, like there are a couple of questions from Luisa Ramirez. The first question is for the first part of the talk and specifically for the mice hunting the crickets. So I'm quoting, the mouse is able to chase the cricket in the dark only if they encounter each other. Did you quantify the behavioral differences between light and dark setups after the first encounter? Because from the videos, it seems they are quite similar, suggesting that they do not rely on vision at such near distances. Uh, would this suggest a multisensory task switching from vision to other sensory input, uh, such as hearing, let's say? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So yeah, I think a lot of it is that um, the crickets aren't making a lot of auditory cues when they're just out there in the arena. And once the mouse bumps into it and they start chasing each other, there's a lot of noise for the, the mouse to be able to pursue the cricket. Uh, it may also be that the auditory is more about being able to say what's in front of me as opposed to localizing something from a distance. But you're right, and once they're close up to it and able to pursue it, it, it looks quite similar. Uh, in fact, my neighbor here at UO, Mike Weir, who studies uh, auditory cortex, has set up a task that's a little bit more biased towards auditory. He actually drops the cricket in so that when it lands, it makes a loud noise and the mouse is able to approach uh, towards it. But again, if it escapes at that point, it's very hard for them to continue pursuing it. They have to be close up to it to pursue it using auditory cues. But yeah, I think there's definitely some interesting interactions there. And they, like in all of these, the animal is probably using any cues that are available for it at any given time. Right. Uh, thank you very much for that. The second from Luis again is, do you have some hypothesis on why the receptive fields in active vision are almost equal to those obtained with the head fixed? Would this be related to some compensatory gaze behavior? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I should mention it is, it's a, a relatively small subset on the order of a quarter or a third of them that have receptive fields in both of them that match up. So there's a lot of room for things to be you know, quite different, either modulated by uh, behavioral state or changes that occur as a result of movement. Uh, but I think at least in a subset of cells, you know, the same types of filtering that you want to do are going to be true in head fix and free moving, especially once you have the saccade and fixate that gives you a stable image, even as you're moving, that at least, you know, some of the filters are going to be similar. You're going to have Gabor filters that analyze the static scene, and there may be more complex types of filters that occur that are either addressing things like movement or the three-dimensional structure of the world, the types of things that aren't present in head fix. So... So I think on the one hand, like I mentioned, it is gratifying that we saw something that's similar, that things do match up. It also said, you know, Hubel and Weasel weren't wrong. <laughs> a lot of what we know about the visual system is definitely still true in free movement. You know, that we get these, you know, linear filters in a, in a subset of cells, but that suggests that there is probably more going on there that we just haven't tapped into yet. Right. Uh, the third question appearing from Andrew Alexander is kind of similar, I would say. So in the free moving experiment, is there any relationship, uh, black and white, the position orient, ah, sorry. So for the position or, or the orientation of the animal and the preferred uh, receptive fields, wondering if activation of some receptive fields occurs more frequently in specific positions or uh, views? That's a good question. Um, so I think there may be two things there in case, uh, in case I didn't interpret the question right, I'll address both. One of which is kind of where are they looking within? So you might've noticed that the environment that we have is quite complex. And really we kind of set it up to have every possible type of visual contrast available, just because this was the first time we were mapping receptive fields. In this case, we want to have every everything that would drive it. So we had, you know, 
the three-dimensional objects in the arena. We had gratings and white noise on the wall. We had moving spots on a monitor. We haven't gone back yet to see where the neuron, or basically where was the mouse looking in the context that drove specific types of responses. So it could be that those nice linear receptive fields were primarily when the animal was looking at, you know, a stationary static image on the wall, and that the neurons that we couldn't map responses to were, you know, in the context where they were uh, looking at the blocks on the floor. So there's that question about where it, within that particular environment were they looking. I think another interesting question is about within their visual field in general. Are there differences in the response properties in the lower visual field versus the upper visual field? And this is true, you know, particularly for a mouse that's on the ground. So their, you know, lower visual field is really dominated by this, you know, the perspective of a floor that they're just, you know, a couple centimeters above. So they have the foreground, you know, in the lower visual field, and then the background in the upper visual field. Um, and so you can imagine there'd be very different types of response properties for analyzing things that are on the ground close in front of you versus analyzing landmarks in the distance. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing to study as well. Again, it kind of goes back to the difference between real natural scenes versus, for example, showing a clip from a movie, especially from a human movie where there's a camera panning at head height is going to be very different from right, yeah. view, uh, moving in a very erratic way on the ground. Uh, before we switch gears towards the octopus, uh, one question that I have is like, maybe you mentioned and I missed it. So when the mouse, the mouse is actually moving in the arena, does this change how many gaze shifts you have like by actually yeah. moving the eyes or not? No, that, that's a great question. In fact, there's almost no gaze shifts when the animal's sitting still. So if they aren't moving their head, their eyes are almost stationary. There's kind of some slow drift. Occasionally they'll twitch their head a little bit and do an eye movement, but they aren't, for example, just shifting their gaze around the, the room. They're really their head, their eye movements are coupled to head movements. Right. It's so also it's not our work, but you know, Jasper Port in their paper explained why, you know, most people who have looked at head fixed mice, there's very few eye movements, they're very occasional. Uh, but he actually showed that the times when a head fixed mouse does move its eyes, he measured the force on the head fixation, showed that it's when the mouse is trying to move its head that it also gets an eye movement. So I was the just, mouse, they're yeah. really coupled to each other. I was just wondering whether you can somehow um, distinguish between locomotion and gaze movements or just gaze movements or visual stimuli changing, like discern between ego motion and change in the visual field or visual field change by itself. Yeah, no, and I think that's great. And I should mention in those periods of fixation, if the animal is moving forward, there's still going to be optic flow and all right. other types of self-motion occurring there. So I think that would be the context to look for that. Within the compensatory periods, what's the change in visual input? Um, due to self-motion versus uh, object motion. Right. So switching gears now uh, for the last question that is in the chat and we can continue offline for people uh, that might still be interested. So it's from Sam Budov. Uh, in the octopus, do you observe something akin to saccades or is it more complicated given the flexibility of their bodies? That's a great question. So we, we haven't looked at that ourselves. Everything we've been doing is kind of in this uh, fixed preparation. Uh, so we, we haven't looked at that. Other people, though, uh, in fact, uh, I know Michael Land mentioned this in one of the, I don't know if he did this or if he just was mentioning somebody else's studies, but it has actually showed that octopus or cephalopods do also do a saccad and fixate type pattern. That as they move their head, you know, uh, if, or in particular with an OKR, uh, if you drive an OKR response, they'll track it with their bodies and their heads. And as they're, you know, moving their head to track a prey, they get that same saccad and fixate uh, pattern. So it's not clear yet whether they have targeted saccades like primates do, but they definitely do have a, you know, uh, something resembling a VOR and saccade and fixate pattern that results. Right. Okay. And with that, I think uh, it's time to go uh, offline. So I will be thanking uh, Chris once again for this uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I'm posting the Zoom room link in case uh, people didn't uh, bookmark it. And Chris, just so you know, because you cannot see the messages currently, okay. there were both greeting messages and thank you messages, but they will remain available for you to catch up later. Uh, so thank you very much uh, once again. Great. Thanks, George. So we are officially uh, offline.